As president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the release of our new report, Forging Climate Solutions, How to Accelerate Action Across America. The Academy was founded in 1780 by John Adams, James Bowden, John Hancock, and other scholar patriots to cultivate every art and science which may tend to advance the interest, honor, dignity, and happiness of a free, independent, and virtuous people. Since its founding, the Academy has brought together leaders from every scholarly field and profession to provide independent, nonpartisan advice to the nation and the wider world. The Commission on Accelerating Climate Action upholds these founding principles of the Academy as one of the most diverse groups of experts to engage with the pressing issue of climate change. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. In 2021, the Academy's Board of Directors issued a statement conveying that the American Academy stands with the scientific community and others committed to climate action in recognizing the urgent need for a long-term commitment by every segment of our society. The Academy assembled the Commission on Accelerating Climate Action to explore how the United States can accelerate action across sectors and political divides. Today, we are gathered to celebrate the release of the Commission's final report. We're pleased to have such a close-knit panel today. Having worked on the report extensively, there is no group better suited to the task. Our panelists include the four co-chairs of the Commission, Mustafa Santiago Ali, Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation, Christopher B. Field, the Perry L. McCarty Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, and the Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies at Stanford University, David G. Victor, Professor of Innovation and Public Policy, co-director of the Deep Decarbonization Initiative at the University of California, San Diego, non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and Patricia Vincent Kalan, chairman and chief executive officer of PM Resources. The Academy is deeply grateful to these four, not only for this final product, but for their time and expertise and for guiding the group through challenges the last two years. I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Commission who have joined us in person and virtually today and thank them for their hard work, dedication, and contributions to this important effort. This report offers a blueprint for our nation's response to climate change in a way that coordinates efforts across sectors, ideological divides, and the many other forms of diversity that characterize our nation. That blueprint includes five strategies and 21 recommendations for forging these connections and it articulates how a whole of society commitment can emerge. The report is a way forward for American climate policy, which currently lacks a broad, durable commitment to accelerate the pace of action. It is our duty as a society to ensure that the benefits of climate action, health, economic prosperity, and political voice are enjoyed by all Americans. I want to commend the Commission for meeting a moment for recognizing the urgency of the climate crisis while also centering equity, justice, and fairness. This report tries to do something unique by identifying recommendations that are politically feasible and creating an accessible report that can be widely understood. That would not have been possible without the guidance of the more than 80 experts we spoke to, many of whom are on this call today, and the leadership of our co-chairs and commission. It would also not be possible without the generous support of our funders, Roger Sant and Doris Matsui, Hans-Jörg Wies, Bob Higgins, the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment, William and Henry pa Helen Pounds, the David and Ellen Lee Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and an endowment provided by John E. Bryson and Louise Henry Bryson. Thank you for your belief in this work and for making it possible. Lastly, we're grateful to Laura Helmuth, Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, for moderating today's panel. It's my pleasure to call on Laura to get us started. She's the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States. She's been an editor for the Washington Post, National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, and Science Magazines. She's a former president of the National Association of Science Writers and currently serves on the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication. This year, the National Center for Science Education gave her a Friend of Darwin Award. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. 
Thanks to all of you for coming today, and, and thanks to the co-chairs, and congratulations. This is a huge achievement. <laughs> I know some of you may be seeing it for the first time. This report, it's, it's beautifully written, which I, you know, that's my expertise, is editing and writing, and this is a breeze to read. It's also very hopeful. It's very clear. It's very urgent, actionable, inclusive. Uh, and I think it's just it's a great contribution to um, to clarifying what we need to do and what we can do uh, to address climate change. So uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here, really excited to talk about this with all of you. And thanks, everyone in the audience and online who participated in creating this. Um, so we're going to have a conversation among ourselves and then we'll open it up for your questions um, in, in about half an hour or so. So, you know, please, uh, you know, if there's something we don't get to, we want to hear from you and also from the people in the audience. Um, but I'll start out by uh, asking about the, the the makeup of the commission that created this report. Uh, it is one of the most diverse groups of people who've ever come together uh, to look at climate change, diverse perspectives, diverse areas of expertise, different kinds of background. Um, and Mustafa, would you mind starting us out? You tell us a little bit about, you know, how that worked. Um, it, one of the things I like in the conclusion is uh, you say, you know, we started out, 31 people had different ideas about climate action. Three years later, we still disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's really interesting. Um, what did Shirley Chisholm once said? If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a chair. Uh, everybody brought their chairs um, to, to make sure, you know, it's really interesting because folks did come from so many different diverse backgrounds and sets of experiences. And we talk about ideologies and a number of other things. And uh, we had to learn uh, about each other. The first thing is about building trust. We often jump into these sets of meetings and sets of designs around policy or reports, and we don't spend time actually getting to know each other. And we actually had the opportunity and the space to do that, which was incredibly important. And then out of that, you build trust because you can't have respect if you don't build trust. Um, so, you know, we had to really begin to go through that process. Um, and what came out of that is actually what you see there, because it's more than just words in a report. It is a set of life lessons of people's work, uh, their experiences on the ground. Um, and, and how we can find a pathway forward. Um, so it was, it was a, my grandmother often talks about blessings and I talk about blessings. It was a blessing, but that blessing came through uh, hard work and sets of conversations and, and beginning to not only trust each other, but value what each other had to share. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, the report is very explicit that, you know, people came to it with different ideologies, different, um, different priorities. And uh, but with a shared sense of urgency, I think, and mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, does anybody else want to? You know, I, I think it's important to recognize that there was a diagnosis and by the American Academy and by the co chairs before it started that the fundamental problem we're trying to solve is that the table has been too small, mm -hmm. that there are important perspectives, important experiences that haven't been engaged in the climate conversation. So we went out very explicitly to build a group that was more diverse than certainly any other climate group that I've been associated with. And I think that it was that uh, initiative that, you know, made it possible to at least strive for the shared understanding that Mustafa has spoken about. And, uh, and I, I agree with him that it really paid off. But, but our understanding was that until you have a framework that can integrate all these perspectives from different walks of life, different parts of the country, you're not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. we'll just go in order. Okay. <laughs> well, a machine here. <laughs> um, I just want to pick up on one aspect of the diversity I think is so important, perhaps in this town in particular, which is the ideological diversity. This is a consensus report. What's new about it is the package of recommendations. Individuals probably don't agree on every single word. I know that's true, but they agree on the package. And I think that's really important because this is a long term. This is a transformation of the economy. It's a transformation of our relationship with nature, a bunch of other things. And it can't happen in sprints. It, we need a, the, the theory of politics here, the theory of change is one where you put together and you hold together 
a durable, as David Oxby said in the beginning, a durable coalition that spans ideology. And the, the commission worked, the idea for this began when the Trump administration was in power. Then we had the, the, the first part of the Biden administration, we had a unified government. Then we have divided government. We have a, a lot of shifting winds. And I think it's really, really important that we pay attention to the long term and to holding this coalition together. I would pick up on something Chris said because um, the academy started out with this idea that we needed to be diverse in you know age, ethnicity, ideology, all sorts of things. But then the, the process itself of picking the members, it took us about six months maybe to actually pick the members because you wanted to get your, there are no shrinking violets on this commission, I promise you that. But they, they needed to be people of goodwill that would be willing to work together across all that diversity. So I think that the, probably the, our most important task was the actual selection of individuals. And we, we looked very long and hard to make sure we had that wonderful collection of individuals mm -hmm. that could rise above their personal differences to uh, agree with the fabric of what we, we designed. And, and so some of their backgrounds, to be specific, you have people from arts, yes. uh, we, we'll hear uh, from law, from science, um, from the public sector, from, um, from private sector, uh, and religious communities. Mm -hmm. Youth. Youth. Youth, yes, yeah. Indigenous, indigenous, indigenous knowledge and indigenous peoples, yeah. Yes. Fantastic. And one of the things in the, the report mentioned is that when you started out, you had kind of different vocabularies. Um, and so I think in part of it was just learning how to understand each other, like literally what do your words mean and what, you know, what, what is the context, what is the worldview. Um, and so I imagine all of you learned a lot about, about different ways of seeing climate uh, over the course of the past few years. So I sound a little embarrassed because I'm a journalism major, right? And so I know that words matter, but I have to admit in the beginning I was rolling my eyes a little bit and thinking, why are we spending so much time on the words, right? Can't we, can't we get to the ideas? Um, but I came to really understand how important the words were and people weren't arguing about words for words sake. And I'll, I'll pick on lawyers for a little bit. Sorry, Emily. We, we've all seen lawyers argue over words for words sake sometime, but this was about how to best communicate to this particular groups or person's constituents in a way that would motivate them for action. Mm -hmm. So it was meaningful. Uh, word discussion, and it really was something I think that opened uh, my eyes to as we went through this process. That was that was a huge learning for me. So. That's great. And words are on ramps, oh, right? Nice. Yeah. So you can create words that stop folks yeah. from entering into a process, or you can make sure that folks see themselves reflected in the language. Um, and being able to navigate that to make sure that um, the vast majority of our country sees themselves mm -hmm. um, was. It took work, but it was worth the investment. And I think one of the one of the words or, or uh, phrases that that comes up a lot in this report that it just seemed really powerful to me is the concept of a fair bargain, um, which I suspect is something that means a little bit something a little bit different to each member of the commission. Um, could we talk about that a little bit about what you mean by a fair bargain and and how how that helped guide your your thinking for the whole report? Mm -hmm. And if, if you want to go in order, um, or if anybody wants to pop up, I don't want to make Mustafa. I, I, I think Chris order. wants to jump up. <laughs> so, yeah. The concept of a fair bargain is really central, and uh, each of the words means really a lot. But we, we've talked about the fairness component already, but, but the bargain part is also important. There was a lot of discussion about how environmental justice, environmental concerns need to be integrated into decisions about energy development and adaptation investments. Uh, but there was also a lot of discussion about the way that the tr traditional environmental and justice communities need to be more open to the idea of accelerating progress through deploying a very wide range of technologies, including technologies that a lot of these groups uh, historically opposed, detest, and um, and investments in infrastructure for adaptation that that are very um, fraught in the context of the broader environmental discussions, and this this sense of a bargain where where people from across the the political economic 
um, faith perspective see uh, advantages and are, are willing to at least consider compromises mm -hmm. is a really key part of, of this report. Mm -hmm. And it's also a key component of the idea of building a durable political coalition around action on climate. I guess I'm the, I think the fair bargain is one of these giant on-ramps that Mustafa mm -hmm. was talking about. Um, from my perspective, what's so interesting about the fair bargain, it emerged from these conversations inside the commission where people from different perspectives saw the same concept around fairness and justice and so on, but in different ways. And so the language around the fair bargain is designed to show how if this is done well, all different communities can benefit from action on climate, in particular communities on the, on, the, on the front lines. So I think it's important in that sense. It's also important in the sense that Serious action on climate, which is both controlling emissions and dealing with the physical impact, resilience. Serious action on climate is not something that one agency does or one part of government does or just the federal government does. So you've got all these different folks and institutions out doing different things. How do their actions fit into a larger picture? And that's what this report is about. That's why the word blueprint is in it. And, and, and that's the concept, and it all revolves around the fair bargain. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I like about the report is that we have examples in there of what the fair bargain looks like. I remember one of our early meetings, one of the commission members said, I think we all want to do it, but we're not sure what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's lots of different ways. So we found some real life examples to show people what it could look like and that it doesn't need the federal government to intervene. It can be done locally and in other places. Obviously, federal government action could be um, exponential in, in, in terms of zooming things along, but there are places in there where you can see yourself in a community, in a utility, you know, doing the fair bargain. And, and I think it, it takes work, but in the long run, it's gonna have better results. So James Baldwin once said that if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things that you don't see. So when you look at this report, it, as, as Pat shared, you know, it highlights all these amazing individuals who are doing the work. And, and that's something that often doesn't show up in many of the stories that are out there. But let's have some real talk also. So it is also about there are certain communities that the words environmental justice resonate with because they breathe it and they taste it, and they see the impacts that are going on. There are other communities who may meet the words environmental justice are not the right words for them. So a fairness can play out in a way to help people to understand that they are also a part of the set of work um, and, and that they're valued and honored. When we look at places like Mitch, who's in the back of the room and where I come from, you know, we have coal communities who are transitioning and who um, are going through all kinds of these different dynamics. You want to make sure that they know that they're being seen along with the communities that are in Cancer Alley or in the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, or the diesel death zone in California. So all of this is about making sure that people are honored and valued and that they're, you know, that they're being seen. Yeah, and I like also that the fair bargain encompasses um, pragmatism and accountability. Uh, it's all very doable. Um, and, you know, it, it's easy thinking about climate change to either be overwhelmed or to, you know, to get, uh, you know, kind of high level and, and abstract. But, but yeah, as, as you pointed out in, in this report, there are a lot of specific examples of people doing the work in ways that are potentially scalable um, or that can inspire others. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to ask each of you if, that, if you have a favorite example that you could, could sketch out quickly or, or a type of example, um, because I think showing that climate solutions are possible, are being done, are things we can all learn from. Um, you know, sometimes the examples make the, make the case better than, than uh, the, the, more, you know, the more general language. Um, anybody would want to share a favorite example, either from this report or, or from your own work? I'll start. I'm a Chilo, but I have two. Um, and, and one of them is ours at, at PNM. We, um, we shuttered some coal plants, but we had long worked with the Navajo Nation before that and had given them scholarships and educated them for jobs outside of the coal mine and the coal plant because we knew that this energy transition was coming. But then we worked with the, the state to bring economic development, job training, and other monies that would be invested in that community. Because if you're Navajo, you don't want to leave your native land. And so we needed to make sure that there were things 
and jobs for the Navajos um, to do there. And there's a longer story in there. But the other one that I love, and it's because I'm in a utility building things, and there's an example in there of Dominion Energy and the work that they have done with their communities to make that transition, not laying off employees, getting the transition done. So there's a couple really specific examples in there because one of the things we know is that we're going to have to build a lot of different clean energy sources. We're going to have to build a lot of transmission. Um, and so there's examples of how it can be done while taking this fair bargain into account. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think compared with five years ago, there's now a lot of money flowing into climate, not enough still trying to figure out in particular how to mobilize private investment, but directionality is, is very encouraging. All that said, it's easy to talk about the fair bargain. People need to know what to believe, they need to see real projects and, and so on. Um, I am very encouraged to see the lessons around siting now being brought into new projects. So we're seeing this happen in Northern California where there's early stages of projects around offshore wind, where rather than just developers coming in and saying we're gonna do offshore wind, they're doing extensive consultation with local communities, trying to figure out where and how do you bring the power on shore? How do you deal with uh, uh, fishing activities that also can co-locate with wind or not, depending on how things are designed? And the awards of these projects are conditional upon that engagement. And that's how we're gonna show the fair bargain is actually delivering benefits, is building things and building things in a way that generates more of the benefits locally, in particular frontline communities. David mentioned that we started this whole process during the Trump administration, and one of the things that's been super interesting and and um, exhilarating in many ways is that um, seeing progress in the Biden Harris administration on things like uh, committing investments of IRA funds into um, <clears throat> into e economically disadvantaged areas. And California climate legislation has the same thing with a with a fraction of the money that needs to go into economically disadvantaged areas. And I think that's really a critical element of building this durable political coalition. People need to perceive that they're benefiting. They need to feel like they're part of the program. And they also need to feel a level of engagement where decisions about uh, how projects move forward, where they're cited, and um, how they manage is something that people can feel ownership of and, and targeting investments to areas that have uh, traditionally been left behind is a really key component of that. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with about a thousand communities both inside this country and outside. Um, Pat uh, talked about the Navajo uh, project which I really um, have a lot of respect for. I think the other project that I think is incredibly important for folks in this room, those who are watching and others to look at is the Regenesis project in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The reason that I raise that is because many of the communities that I've worked with have both housing needs, they have transportation needs, they have needs to be able to hold community together in a cultural way. They have the need to create jobs. Uh, they have the need to be able to embrace a new clean economy. And this project took a $20,000 environmental justice small grant, of, uh, a program that one time folks were talking about getting rid of and has now leveraged in over $300 million in changes. And it has been supported by, you know, both Democrats and Republicans and built over 140 partners. So all of these are super important. Um, we always have to ask the question, what does transformation actually look like? What does revitalization actually look like? Um, so these examples help us to have that, that blueprint. Maybe I'll change it to a green print. Uh, <laughs> to to the, you know, the, the possibilities that are out there, no matter which communities you come from, whether rural or urban. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it's, it's really inspiring to see the coalitions on a local scale that have supported all of these projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know th this report is all about building uh, building coalitions, meaningful and lasting and durable coalitions. Um, and the you know the sub the subtitle is how to accelerate action across America. And I think that acceleration, uh, you know, this is such an exciting time because things are happening and they just need to speed up and we can mm -hmm. speed them up. Um, so yeah, it, it's a it's a really good perspective to have. Um, so we've talked a bit about siting, permitting, infrastructure, uh, you know, all of these decisions are made sometimes locally. 
um, you know, where do you see, uh, you know, specifically for infrastructure, um, you know, obviously there's been a lot done in the past few years. What are your you know, biggest goals um, that you think could, you know, through this guidance uh, could help with that sort of, you know, with the decisions that are being made every day about where to build stuff and how to build stuff? Mm-hmm. We need worked examples of how actually engaging communities improves the prospects for projects. There are many projects moving along. We've just talked about some examples. That needs to become commonplace so that you can actually build these, build, build these projects. There's a lot of emphasis on projects that control emissions, and a lot of that revolves around electric power. That's exactly right. I think one of the other, a fifth of the report is also about the infrastructure and strategy for dealing with the physical impacts of climate change. Because despite all the progress that's being made on controlling emissions globally, we're still in for a lot of climate change. And so we need to be ready for that. We need to have a strategy for that. Right now, it's all kind of haphazard. It's mainly a state and local activity that's fitting and proper, but there needs to be some element of a federal strategy. It involves infrastructure in some places, like water infrastructures. We had a walking tour around Miami of, mm-hmm. of water supply and sewage, sewage systems. I mean, that's the nuts and bolts of, of resilience. And so that part of the infrastructure, I think we are really far behind in the country in, think, in thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And there's some specific um, suggestions in the report. And one of the great things the commission did is recognize that the permitting process is necessary. We need to make sure that environmental justice is served, that um, the, the, the land is taken care of. And the question is how to take those really good things of the permitting process, but shorten it a, a little bit. And there, are, so there, were, there were some in the, in legislation, but you know, just little things like the the you know the federal government's FACA Act, right, where you can't bring in people up front. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how you get this done, right? Is to bring people in up front. So to change that, to have some um, studies done of renewable groups, to maybe have some of them that don't have to have NEPA if they're clean energy projects, you know, off the federal land. So there's some specifics in there, and and this is probably one of the areas. That, because part of this is this, this whole report is about starting a discussion, and this needs some more work to be done. And I you know Chris has done some work at Stanford on some of uh, these processes, but keeping that discussion going, and this may be one of the areas in terms of mobilizing investment and permitting that we need to get some specific folks in a room and start thinking about how do we continue to make the process go quicker but without losing the environmental protections and the community um, uh, protections in it. And I know, you know, in our industry, we have to say, you know, it, uh, um, DOE, DOE or EPA now um, requires you to do some community consultations in your plans. And that is a really good thing. Mm-hmm. It's a really, really good thing. And so I think it's, it's putting, actualizing those things is going to be very important. Yes. Yeah. It's about co-development. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we've trillions of dollars are yeah. going to move. Mm-hmm. So we want to make sure that everyone's voice is a part of that. It's almost like I'm country, so I like country examples. <laughs> you know, it's almost like someone saying they're going to come in your house and they're going to move the couch over here and they're going to move the kitchen upstairs where the bathroom used to be and so forth and so on without there being any consultation with you about what you want your home to look like. I mean, that's a very simplistic way of saying that we really need to make sure that folks are fully engaged in the process, that their voices matter, um, and that they're helping to make the decisions. And we just got to make sure that the folks who have traditionally not had the opportunity to play a significant role in that now do. Um, And, you know, hopefully we were able to zero in on that so that folks can give that strong consideration. I might actually go to Mustafa for advice on home decoration. (laughs) (laughs) You You know, I think... In the infrastructure space, we have wonderful opportunities for win-wins, and mm-hmm. that's something we really need to be looking for ac- across the, the whole climate effort. Uh, we know we need trillions of dollars of infrastructure for basic transportation and communication and healthcare, things like that. And, and by bringing in diverse voices and a, and a developed scientific understanding of what the risks are, we can make those investments in infrastructure a lot smarter. Mm-hmm. And the the concept that we are gonna that we're gonna build out this infrastructure by addressing things that that we need independent of climate, but but adding on the smarts about 
being thoughtful about the climate responses really opens the doors to uh, a really compelling set of win-wins, which is where we need to have this conversation go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and the win-wins it seems like one of the potential ways to, to break down some of the polarization and politicization of what should be, you know, pretty you know, obvious good decisions. But people need to believe it. They need to see real projects. Yeah. They need to see real benefits. Yeah. Moving from the theoretical. Mm-hmm. For so long, the climate uh, movement was focused on science, which is incredibly important, but it was very a theoretical conversation. Mm-hmm. And people couldn't see themselves reflected in what was happening. And that's why, as David says, and Chris and Pat, when we have these examples of projects of real folks who can see themselves reflected because they see communities that look like them, then people are much more likely to at least explore the possibilities. That also drives how you talk about the issue. We have mm-hmm. the, Kathleen Paul Jamison is, is in the uh, audience here as a commission member and helped us lead efforts to understand how to improve education and improve communication, mm-hmm. which is not just scientists telling everybody, you know, pay attention to the science that plays a role, mm-hmm. but this diminishing impact, but it's different voices, authentic voices in different communities mm-hmm. speaking to what people care about. Yeah. And just to build on what David just shared, you have to have ambassadors. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. Mitch also um, has helped us to stay focused on this. You got to have folks who are trusted uh, inside of communities who are sharing the information and also who are hopefully a part of those sets of projects that are out there. And I don't think we can sort of reinforce that enough that if you don't have that, then it's going to be extremely difficult to get people. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things I really appreciate about this report is the emphasis on communication, on engagement, on listening, um, and you know, I, identifying real ambassadors, like you say. It's uh, and and uh, you know, here it is, and just bullet points. Do this, this, and this. Uh, it makes it seem very achievable. Um, let's see. So I also wanted to ask about uh, you know some of the examples here are about uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, which is a term you know, I think some of us are seeing more and more in the past few years. It's you know it's it's a really kind of inspiring and a different way to think about uh, climate solutions. Does anybody have a favorite you know way of thinking about nature-based solutions or a specific example that you want you think people should know more about? Chris, well, one of the, one of the real opportunities with next steps on climate is to think hard about the role of of ag states and farmers in particular. And um, Mitch is a real specialist in the, in the ag bill. And understanding where it makes sense to have payments for farmer practices that add carbon to soils and increase soil fertility, uh, where we have opportunities for increasing the area of forests, uh, is another example of where we can have win-wins. The, the most compelling backstory in the natural climate solution space is that where we invest in natural climate solutions, we can improve habitat, we can uh, sustain biological diversity, uh, rural economies can often be strengthened, mm-hmm. and um, indigenous communities can have uh, opportunities to pursue their highest priorities. We need to be smart about the deployment and we need to recognize that natural climate solutions, while critical, are only going to deliver part of the of the progress that needs to be made, but they're beautiful examples of places where we can identify multiple wins that, that overlap. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that was important about the, the report in Nature-Based Solutions is that sometimes they can be expensive. Mm-hmm. And so to make sure that, that all farmers, for example, can take advantage of them, not just the big corporate farms, right? Mm-hmm. Because what you don't want to do is put in a solution that puts the family farmer or the marginalized farmer out of business. And so that's, again, where we call for the fair bargain in terms of how to work through nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, and um, speaking of money, (laughs) so uh, with strategy four is uh, about deploying diverse options for controlling emissions. And uh, there are five um, specific recommendations, uh, starting with a fair price of carbon, how you know what do you, what do you think are the you know biggest potential uh, gains here for controlling emissions? Are there mm-hmm. specific strategies that any of you are, are really excited about, or 
um, anything you, you really want to you know, think would, would help towards the acceleration, especially? Well, go ahead. Forward, I, Chris <laughs> earlier talked about putting all the options on the table, and that involves real compromise. Mm -hmm. And that's important. This is a huge scale. The, the decarbonization is a massive scale. We're not going to do it with single solutions. Everything needs to be on the table, and then we need to evaluate in terms of actual performance. My own view is that um, government spending is at an all-time high in this area. It is true around the world. But when you take a step back and look at the numbers, last year the world spent, depending on whose data you look at, $1.2 trillion or so investing in clean energy. First time in history where the clean spend was bigger than the traditional fossil energy spend. That's, that's progress. Of that $1.2 trillion around the world, um, maybe $300 $400 billion came from governments. The rest of it was from the private sector. So there's a big role for government and government spending. We see this right now in this country. But the really big leverage is going to come from sending credible signals for private investment, often co-investment co with government, especially when where early investments are, are risky. We've got to keep our eyes uh, really, really focused on, on, on that. And that means sending credible signals policy reliability wherever possible. The report has some recommendations that you can do right now, like make sure that the money that the government's spending on Inflation Reduction Act other areas is spent well. There are other things that are, that are harder politically, like putting a carbon tax into place, but we can't forever be just subsidizing clean forms of energy. We have to combine the subsidy for clean energy with regulation and tax incentives and things like that, including ultimately carbon tax and price incentives. And one of the things we talk about here is, is a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, and, you know, because the United States cleans up, right, and we're buying stuff from countries that have not, um, that may be cheaper, doesn't help it because this is a, this is a global problem. And our report focused on the U.S. Um, for two reasons. One, you know, the global issue is, is, is a lot bigger to solve. And because we need to make sure we have that leadership on the on the global stage, so that we can ask others to step up to the plate, how how we did. But this is an area where pragmatism sort of came in because we said that may be more achievable in a divided government. Right there are there are some folks that say, well, that will help maybe make China not so powerful and others. Um, so it was a practical way of kind of starting down that path because lots of times people say, well, we'll wait for our carbon tax, but we can't wait. Right, we need to get going, and there are things that can be done, and that may be one of those that's that's more midterm achievable than long term achievable. And, I mean, uh, technology space. I think there are two key messages. One is that we need a lot more investment. Even Pat have spoken to the pathways the investment can come on. I I think the other thing that's really important is that there's no single silver bullet technology that's going to be the definitive solution. We are going to need to deploy a, a wide range of, of low emissions and zero emissions technologies. If we over deploy any of them, we're going to start running into limits that we're already seeing with lithium mining or niobium mining. Mm -hmm. uh, with land use, if we wanted to do uh, the biomass to electricity. And I think that that understanding that there are going to be roles for a wide range of, of emissions reductions technologies is, is going to be really important, in, in, including emissions reductions technologies that may be provided by companies with a history in the oil and gas space or companies with a history in nuclear energy, that, that an openness to appreciating that we need to build out a really complicated set of interconnecting infrastructures is going to be key to progress. Yeah. So we can all get real wonky on these issues. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this particular area that you're talking about is incredibly important. And I hope folks will really pay attention to it. But I'd like to bring it home for everyone. I just ask everybody to take a deep breath. And just hold it for a second. Because what everyone here has been talking about is directly tied to that. You let it out. Don't pass out. <laughs> and here, here's why. Right. So we know that we've got millions of people who are dying prematurely from air pollution every year. Right. So we're talking about carbon, methane, co-pollutants, all of that plays a role in that space. In our country, we've got 24 million folks who have asthma, 7 million kids, and disproportionately as African-American and Latinx children are the ones who are losing their lives and going to the emergency rooms and those types of things. 
So it is not just about the technologies, right? It's about what good do those technologies do? These new, these sets of opportunities and the choices that folks are going to make. Because we often miss the humanity connection to the sets of actions that we're doing. Um, and what we tried to do through this report is to give folks all these substantive actions that are there, but also link it to real people um, and the opportunity for real change. Um, and that's when I think you can at least touch folks in a way that they're like, okay, let's figure this out. We've got to figure it out together. Yeah, and it is, I mean, this climate, the climate emergency, the climate crisis is about human health, mm -hmm. um, you know, about air pollution, you know, flooding, natural, other disasters uh, that are exacerbated uh, by climate change. And uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, obviously that's something that unites everybody is, you know, concern about their own safety, about the, you know, flood zones and hurricanes, um, tornadoes shifting uh, and, and air pollution. And, and I'm so glad you brought that up. That's one of the examples that is kind of a, a, a positive case. I mean, I'm sure everybody here remembers how smoggy Los Angeles used to be. You couldn't mm -hmm. see across the valley. Um, and you know, the air is cleaner um, thanks to things like the Clean Air Act mm -hmm. uh, and new technology and new regulation. So, it, you know, showing it is possible, um, you know, in, in many people are alive today who wouldn't be because the air is cleaner. Um, so, I, yeah, I love that example. Um, and, but of course, it's you know it's not been equitably deployed. There's you know the the current air pollution is just so uh, so uh, inequitable. Um, so it's great that we're looking at the U.S. I like the idea of of you know this is practical, pragmatic. What you know what can we do is is talk about the U.S. But uh, there are a lot of advantages that can you know that that can you know, extend to the rest of the world that we can learn from the rest of the world also. Uh, because it is a, it's a global challenge, even though there are local solutions. Um, so I wanted to uh, to go back to the one of the uh, strategies. Strategy two is engage and educate diverse communities, and uh, the, one of the recommendations is to combat climate misinformation in the news and social media. And of course, this is a huge problem uh, problem that in in some ways is getting worse. Uh, and from what I understand, you know, everyone on the committee, you know, accepts that. Climate change is real. It's not a climate science denier, um, but plenty of people are who you know, need to be part of the coalition if things are, are really going to change uh, in fundamental ways. Um, do you have any favorite strategies, um, you know, favorite efforts for combating misinformation, either you know at the education level, in social media, uh, in your own you know personal lives? Have you? come up with ways to uh, to fight it. And I, we mentioned Kathleen Hall Jamison is here, and she wrote an article for Scientific American just last year about, mm -hmm. <laughs> about dealing with misinformation mm -hmm. about climate and, and vaccines and, and pandemics and things like that. And uh, it's a hard problem. One of the things we talked about the most was not having the scientists be the spokespeople. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Pat. I, was, I, was, I mean, some of it... Um, the, you know, the, the social media misinformation is, is much harder um, to do, but I think a lot of it is just what people can do in their communities, right? And, you know, uh, for example, in utilities, research shows that if somebody knows someone that works for the utility, they feel more favorably about it, right? I know when I got my COVID vaccine, I told the whole company, right? Um, because if they know someone, it makes it easier for them to adopt. And it's also the different messages, right? When we shut down our coal plants, we had some um, Republicans that were somewhat doubtful. And I said, well, you may not believe in climate change, but I think you believe in economics. Mm -hmm. And this makes sense from an, an economic standpoint. So it's finding, and, 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 and Mitch is a great example of this, finding the words and what's meaningful mm -hmm. to them. So they may not believe in climate change, but they're okay with what you're doing and, and, and they believe in, in what you're doing. And I think on the social media, we just need to continue to get our messages out. Mm -hmm. And hopefully um, there's more of a solution with the, with the government stepping in on social media, on all sorts of things, right? With mm -hmm. the vaccines, um, you know, conflicts, um, everything. I think people are starting to realize that the, the media, uh, social media in particular, is not their best friend. Yeah. But I don't have kids, so I can say that. <laughs> yeah. Or you can clone Marshall Shepard, who's in the room, yeah. who does an excellent job at being able to break these issues down. 
So here's the, here's the reality of some of the situations that are going on. You know, trusted sources, we've talked a little bit about that. You know, your weatherman is somebody uh, who folks trust um, and finds ways of helping people to understand some of the dynamics that they're dealing with when they walk out the door, when they look out the window. Your doctor is someone primarily who folks trust and docs are now beginning to pay much more attention uh, to the impacts that are happening and having you know conversations with folks about one getting educated and two being able to share that um, being able to have young people have conversations with their parents and their grandparents that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily change what their views are but what you want is folks just to begin to think critically about these issues and then hopefully um, make the choices that'll be necessary to move forward. There are a number of things that we can do um, to engage with folks um, and, and to begin to move the needle. I'll say very, very briefly, I know you, you want to cut the audience, but um, I think it's also important that we not overreact to the deniers. They're there, no question about it. Maybe a tenth of the American public is a hardcore denier. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to budge them. But that puts 90% of the public in play with the right messaging. And it means identifying the messengers and the, and, the, and, the, and, and the folks, the communities you want to reach. There's a group called Science Moms, for example, that has moms as the spokespeople about climate and the impact on, on children and on their health. Um, there's a lot of evidence that Latina women are very important uh, swing voters. So there's specific messaging connected to, to them. And that's, and they're not scientists, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> and so we scientists probably need to be talking, you know, yelling less about, you know, gee whiz, look at my chalkboard and all those cool equations and why we're right. And a little, and we need to be much more strategic as a community about how, how do you reach different audiences? Mm -hmm. And I think a longer term solution is, is talking about educating about climate in schools, right? Now that's not done overnight, right? Curriculums are redesigned maybe every five to 20 years, but starting to work on that will empower, because because we're going to be dealing with this for a long time, will empower these generations to be able to, to have the facts to make their decisions. And um, it was interesting, Wyoming, who many would think would be a state that would, uh, doesn't do this, teaches climate change mm -hmm. in their schools. And so it can be done, um, and we just need to work on that in the longer term. You just have to remember the examples also of the past that it always helps me and mentors share with me when we were dealing with acid rain. There were folks who said that you couldn't make change there. We did it. I mean, it took work. It took education. Lead. People said, well, lead doesn't cause all these problems. And folks fought against, you know, lead being in paint and a number of other things. And then over time, we were able to, to make the change happen. Um, folks even said cigarettes didn't cause cancer. Seriously. And, you know, work very diligently. Um, to, to, to say that that wasn't true, of course, now that we know that it is. So you just have to understand the dynamics that are there and then figure out how do I get the right information in the right way to folks so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. And, um, and I believe that we can do it. Good. So I'd like to open it up for questions from any of you in the room or anyone watching online. Um, and also, if you, you all want to ask each other questions, you can do that too. But let's see, I think we have a, a roving microphone. Is that right? Yeah, we, yeah, there are microphones just so that people in the, uh, in the online audience can hear too. Hi, my name is Dr. Morgan DiCarlo. I'm a fellow with the EPA's Integrated Climate Sciences Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question directly follows up to the last tale of that conversation. Um, my background's water systems. Some of the major uh, investments in water infrastructure are being likened to having a suite of brand new cars, but no mechanics. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak at all to what the report or what your findings tell you about building a climate workforce or ways to get people um, educated in STEM point that they are pursuing it as a career, getting these technologies out there. Thank you. Um. There's a huge educational component to this and a good jobs component to this. And a lot of this is um, related to trades and not the classic four-year university degree. That's a kind of familiar discussion. It's familiar to us as well. I think it's also really important that we start really building things and showing the direction of travel in terms of investment. Because you'll see a whole lot of people 
getting involved in these businesses, whether it's the infrastructure businesses associated with resilience, the physical effects of climate change, which is mainly a state and local activity, this is a federal role, but mainly a state and local activity. Uh, we see this in the electric power industry. The electric power industry is the centerpiece of decarbonization because we're not going to electrify everything, but the, almost every study shows, and we academics are in the disagreement business, but one of the agreements that academics have is uh, decarbonization means electrification. So that means more power lines, that means uh, smarter grids, things like that. And there's a big surge of interest and employment in that field. And as you, people see credible jobs, then it's not automatic, but I think that's actually a very large part of the signal that needs to be sent to the workforce. And one of the things that we're doing in the electric power industry is partnering with, with our, we're all pretty much unionized, right? Partnering with our unions to help us go into the high schools because you know, to your point, you don't need a four-year degree. You don't even need to go to community college to be a, a well-paid uh, lineman. So really getting in and working with the unions, and they're very involved in this, in terms of helping to train uh, the next generation, uh, whether they're working in water systems or utilities, um, it is very, very um, helpful. Some of the things in the um, Infrastructure Act, right, and the IRA in terms of really encouraging um, union workforce. Um, I know sometimes that's controversial, but it, it's very important and these are good jobs, have been very, very helpful to sort of getting that next generation. Because we saw a lull of people interested and now we're seeing it on the, um, the upswing again. And we're very aggressive in our industry in terms of going after marginalized communities. One of my colleagues at Excel Energy, they have a program to bring people in that have been in jail. And now they are um, teaching them to get the, these really good jobs. So that's where you can get the fairness part in also. Or you can, uh, and you can actually go to folks who are on the ground doing the work. Right. We, the people of Detroit, Ms. Monica, uh, and the folks they have there, they now have an institute that are training young people uh, and returning citizens to actually move into the water infrastructure space. So you have individuals um, like that. You can look at doc the work of Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelks, uh, who's working with Georgia Tech and a number of the other schools there. And they have an organization also called Wawa um, that's actually training, once again, young people uh, to be able to move into these spaces. I can give you a laundry list of, of folks who have these worker training programs. Um, and that's a critical component also to move into these spaces uh, to be able to address the critical infrastructure need that we have and address the climate crisis. Thanks very much. Appreciate all of that. That was a fascinating discussion. I, I want to try to put together a couple of, of pieces, and I wanted to start where, where you started with the comments about building trust among the diversity of people on the panel. Mm -hmm. And then where you were ending, or, or where the conversation is now, maybe is a better way to say it, about the need to build trust in communities. And David, the way you talked about it was you know, as industries develop that uh, that uh, offer employment opportunities, it sort of helps to build that trust and establish this, you know, the, this app. The piece that I'm stuck on a little bit is how long it takes to build trust and how that happens, you know, and Mustafa might have something about, to say about this, at a local level. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in West Virginia last weekend and talking with a shopkeeper, you know, and I think they understood the environmental impacts of coal, but, you know, to them, Coal is what helped their families for generations you know, have good lives. So there's this one path which David was kind of alluding to of you know, it's kind of a big the way I heard it is it's a big industry, you know, big player kind of path where you have lots of jobs created by maybe what end up being a relatively small number of players and this builds trust in people that they're gonna have opportunities. But I think that kind of leaves out this lots of communities and the amount of time it takes to build trust. So I'm just curious about how much the community, the, the panel had the opportunity to wrestle with that. You know, I think our theory of change is that um, the real pushes on the pace are going to need to come from two very different directions. The, the trust building direction that you're describing but also from the investment flow direction. And there is um, sort of a, a, a symbiotic hypothesis behind those that, that 
more investment is going to make people feel more comfortable. Feeling more comfortable is going to create more advocacy for progress, and that those two things will spin together to lead to the kind of acceleration that that we need. The investments are really critical part of it, and and the the community engagement, co-development, trust development, critically important, might get us there eventually. But if we really want to accelerate progress, we need to do the combination. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it goes back to the trusted messengers, right? I mean, we have been working with the, the Navajos and the Pueblos for, for decades. So we were, we were fortunate to be able to have that. But... Um, we keep picking on Mitch, but you know many of his um, his group, the evangelicals, are in these communities, right? And they may not trust your local utility coming in and telling them you're going to shut the coal plant in the coal mine, but they may get it when Mitch and his group go in there and explain it. So working with these folks, but then you have to be genuine. You have to follow up on on training. What are you going to do to get them into one of these new jobs? And right for a while, it was every coal miner was going to turn into a coder, right? That, that's not the solution, but working with the trusted messengers, whether it's the evangelicals, um, whether it's an environmental um, NGO, can be very helpful with the indigenous uh, people in Hawaii and Alaska and other places. Getting them on board, and I think this commission was a great example of where we all built trust, and I would hope that some of our trust transfers to these people so we can work with them to help with our messages, because we do need everybody on board, and we don't have decades to develop the relationships and the trust. Progress moves at the speed of trust. So trust is incredibly important. Trust is, is earned. How do you earn trust? People often ask me the, these questions like it's rocket science. It's like your personal relationships, right? Is there active communication? Is there true listening that's happening there? Do you have that person's interest at heart? I'd love to say their best interest at heart. And I understand that when we deal from a business paradigm, that sometimes those aspects are not as integrated into it, um, but we have to find ways to, to better do that. The other part of it is that the government can't just say, I have some resources uh, and expect that that is going to be transformative. The government or any other entity has to actually spend time in community. Uh, and folks often have a very difficult time in doing that. We created, and yay, EPA, let me give a shout out to EPA, (laughs) the collaborative problem solving model, which came out of, I can't tell you how many conversations with all kinds of different leaders, leaders in business, leaders and, you know, from front lines, states, so forth and so on. So there are these different models out there that show you how you can start to build with people. Uh, And often we're so focused on just getting whatever the goal is done that we don't slow down enough. So when you ask the question, how long does it take? Depends on how much you're making an investment in the process. The other part of it is I'm with David on that. We need to create all these different sets of jobs, but we also got to be focused on entrepreneurialism. So if you go back to, to where some of us come from, we need to be having conversations about how do you start your own businesses in this space? Because a lot of folks, My grandfather, as an example, went down in those coal mines for 40, 50 years and never really had a whole lot that came out of it besides he was able to take care of his family, right? We need to also be talking to folks who haven't traditionally seen themselves as an owner in this new clean economy so that they can hire locally, so that you actually build wealth that revolves around inside of communities. That's another part of the process that we often don't have significant enough sets of conversations about. I believe if we do a number of these different types of things, then we can start to move toward the sets of goals and numbers that science tells us that we have to do, but it is a holistic set of tools um, that we have to bring forward. Um, And I can unpack this more because I know we don't have a whole lot of time. (laughs) Um, it's It's really an exciting time. The problem is, is that we have allowed each other to be so far uh, apart that all of these sets of things that are right there for us that strengthen our country, helps to save the planet, that we don't ever really get to it because everybody's saying, well, if this person said it and they have a D beside their name and I'm an R, then I can't get behind that. Or if this person said it because they're an R or an I, 
You know, so we've got to begin to break this stuff down. And that's just real talk. You know, other folks will get up here and candy coat stuff. I don't do it. I believe that we can actually make real change happen. But we've allowed people to pull us so far apart. And you've ever noticed that the people who are pulling us apart are often the ones who are benefiting. And the rest of the folks who are actually out there trying to put food on the table and keep the lights on are the ones who end up dealing with the impacts. Mitch. Since my name got banned each semester, I was trying to have a final Equal final. time, Mitch. <laughs> um, Tell folks who you are. <clears throat> I'm Mitch Hescox. I am President Emeritus of the Evangelical Environmental Network and been doing this a lot of work years. We're doing this. And a commission member. What's that? And a commission. And a commission member. <laughs> That's correct. I wanted just to tag on to Mustafa's last comment. Building trust, encouraging people to become entrepreneurs is a great fortune. Two quick stories, both happening in South Dakota. Five years ago, a man mortgaged his house, started a company to repair turbines and windmills to have the people climb up. Now the man has 600 and some, employee, 600 and some employees across the country, made a fortune. Just across the border in South Dakota, 10 years ago, a family farm was going bankrupt. They decided, can we save the family farm? put it all on the line, bought new equipment, changed farming practices, went into natural climate solutions, no-till, and now their farm just won an award this week for being a film that was just generated about them, about how they're making money and growing. What I'd like to say is that when the trusted messenger delivers messages of hope, gives people the hope to do it, and helps them to find the resource to do it, is the greatest change agent that we can come upon. And I think that's a good place for us to think about inspiring hope and being the institute in the, the initiators of that hope is one of the greatest things that this report can do. And if we all work together on it, that's what will make a difference. Hey, hey, Amen. And I have to yeah. say, we, we have to push this. We have to accelerate action. No question about it. Mm -hmm. But if we do that, I'll... Uh, Losing sight of the fact this is a social project. It's going to be disruptive in some communities. We do that to our peril. And this is a report about the United States, about how do we get our house in order, how are we more credible. But all kinds of other countries are facing the same challenges. And so when you put it all together, I think we have to be realistic about how quickly change will happen. But if, if we do it in a diligent way, change will happen. We're also in for some significant climate change as a result of that. Had we started 30 years ago on this program, we'd be in a different place. We didn't. We are where we are. But it doesn't mean you don't start in the right way or get continue in the right way, as, as I think we're in a good, good position to do in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have a question from online. Uh, Leo Curran, I am standing on behalf of the people who are online. Uh, we have a couple of questions um, from online, but I'm going to start with one that dovetails nicely with David's comment. Um, what are your plans for outreach and dissemination of this report? Actually, Leo, do you want to speak to that? Or <laughs> yeah. You're really the person who's been, been designing and orchestrating the outreach. Yeah. Today is day one. That's right. <laughs> Today is day one. So Leo Curran, again, I'm a program director at the American Academy. We do have lots of plans for outreach of this report, um, including key topics that are coming from this, things like mobilizing investments, siting and permitting, um, some of these big topics that are coming up uh, federally, at the state level, in communities, um, things that you heard about here. So one of our key approaches to outreach is going to be around bringing together voices that don't always talk to each other, much like our commission. And so who isn't talking to each other but interested in the same things, like siting and permitting, um, that we can bring to together, or things like how do we mobilize investments that folks are not talking to each other. So we're going to have some real efforts in that as well as briefings if you have recommendations of people who might be worth sharing this report, its findings and its approach with, we are happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. Any additions from you all? A related question, how, how can people in the audience help? Can I yeah. okay, can help in at least two ways? Yeah. One is we have all, we're reaching out to lots of partners as the Academy has done in the other commission reports, commission activities, the report is, is not the right concept, it's an activity. Um, and if you see your organization working on parts of this that resonate, maybe not perfectly, but resonate with some of the ideas here, we would love to know about that. The other thing is, um, 
there are a few areas where we're really focusing in. We're working on what does this mean for federal legislation and for implementation? A lot of authorization already in place mm -hmm. and appropriations already in place. That's one. A second is what does this really mean for environmental justice? How do we have real worked examples so that this can scale and people see real credibility here? And a third, as Leo mentioned in passing, is around investment. What does this really mean for investment? And investors who are putting money into infrastructure, why and how do you need to do this in a way that really engages communities so that your projects are more durable? Those are three areas where we have concerted activities. If you think there's another area or other different areas that you, we should be working, please let us know. Also, it's important to remember, this is a report, right? This is a, a tiny step toward solving a gigantic problem, and the American Academy, this commission, wouldn't pretend to really have all the answers or the, um, the horsepower to drive change. Change is going to come from this conversation leading to a dozen conversations, those dozen conversations leading to a hundred and then a thousand, and I, I think everybody who is engaged and interested in this topic has the potential to be a partner and the ultimate success of the project depends on those partnerships spreading through the whole society. And, and Laura, you talked about the report being accessible, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and a good and easy read, right? And um, hopeful and optimistic. And it was done that way purposefully to be a conversation starter and to make it more so that more folks read it and get interested and say, how can we work with you to help, because the last thing we want is to everybody to go home, put this on their bookshelf with everything else. Mm -hmm. right. If I can just share, as you were about to ask your question, find one recommendation in the report that you can truly lean in on and build from there in those sets of conversations inside your organization, in your associations. Um, if you have more than one, that's great, but find one, because often folks will see the huge amount of stuff and just get overwhelmed. But if you can find that one, because it's all about building success, right? People get excited when they're a part of something where they see something moving. Um, so that's the way that I do the work that I do. When I'm working with communities, I'm like, let's identify where we can get some success. And then more people come, and then more people come. So that's one possibility. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, this is a, a brief one. Um, Sorry, the, the diversity of voices in this commission, I think, is the thing that sets it apart, as you said from the very beginning. Um, as you look back on the work of the, the commission, are there voices that you now realize needed to be at the table that, that weren't? And I ask that not as a matter of being critical, but as you go forward, maybe are some of those, are there voices that haven't been in your conversations that you really want to see brought in in the future? Stefan? Mm -hmm. You know me, there's a whole bunch of voices, I think. So. That's why I That's forget. Why we asked you. You, can, you can look at environmental justice and climate justice as an example. There are folks who are getting at it in different ways. So I think that that's incredibly important for our indigenous brothers and sisters and family. There are so many different nations and tribes who could be a part of, of the process. I think that's important. We talked about financing uh, also. So having folks who have experience in the various world of finance is incredibly important. Having folks on the technology side, you know, technology is moving so incredibly quickly. When we first started, we were, there was nobody talking about AI when we first started as just one example. So really being able to take a look at all the different types of folks who are out there um, and get them engaged. So, you know, there are a number of, uh, of additional ones if we probably had the, the hindsight, we would have been able to, to get engaged. Let me add one quick thought. The, uh, the community that really wasn't engaged is the climate denialists and whether or not there are pathways for having them be a part of the conversation. I think it's something we should be aspiring to. Mm -hmm. I would say youth. We had some youth involvement, yeah. but I wish we would have had more yeah. uh, youth involvement in the, in the project. Yeah. So. so a good answer. So yeah. Sign me up. I don't know about the denialists. Yeah. I think we have a pride. We have really skept really, Chris raises a really important question about what could be a strategy to deal with that segment of the American population. Um, we should test a bunch of ideas and see what works. Yeah. And I don't know if any of them will work, but we have got to, we've got to fire on all cylinders. Please join me in thanking Mara, Mustafa, Chris, Raymond, and Pat for a wonderful discussion.
The American Academy is grateful to the members of this commission for a thoughtful set of recommendations which can strengthen America's response to climate change by enacting fair, inclusive, and multi-sector compromises. We invite everyone to join us in continuing a national dialogue on the commission's recommendations as we collectively work toward a brighter future. Thank you all for joining us this morning, both in person here and virtually online. Um, on your way out, those of you here in person, don't forget to stop by the table in the atrium to pick up a, a, a copy of the report if you haven't done so already. And you can also all find the report online at amacad.org slash climate. And now to conclude the event, Commission member Kiloa Fox will read a poem by co-chair Mustafa Santiago Ali. Kiloa. On behalf of the commissioners and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, we've purposefully chosen to highlight two examples from the arts. And as was shared, imagery and words being on ramps. Um, the first I wanted to highlight is actually in the front uh, binding of the cover by Javier Cortada. The inside front cover is a rendering of Miami with acrylic on asphalt. It's underwater HOA elevation drive. The second is Whispers of Change, America's Climate Call. For Mustafa, Mahalo no keia, mele, ke kauna, kahua olelo, ke kahea. In the language of my ancestors and my descendants, mele are songs, they're hymns, they're poems, as, as much as they are calls for action. Thank you for the work to bind our collective action in this beautiful artistic piece that I'll read to you now. Whispers of Change, America's Climate Call. In the rhythm of Earth's hushed plea, from the wildfires dance to storm-tossed sea, America, awake, our journey's not done, unified action, together we run. For a fair bargain, we stride and stand, a nation diverse across this vast land. Equity whispers, justice must sing, for in every heart, change must ring. Oceans whisper tales, islands ablaze, floods wash dreams in a haunting haze. Heat wraps us close in unwelcome embrace, yet in this challenge, a coalition takes place. No silver bullet, no magic cure, but in every action, our commitment sure. Learning and growing the signals we send, a pact for the future, on which we depend. Justice's call for all to hear, marginalized voices, we bring them near. Disruption awaits, transformation anew, companies, communities, the old and the new. For in the dance of sun and rain, together we heal, together we gain. America, listen, in unity we trust, for in the climate crisis, together, is a must. <laughs>